now we're going to have Jesse Contour and Paula Rogers for our next two speakers. Integrating mechanics and narratives will be the major focus of their presentation. And uh, before we actually get started, let me give you a little bit of a background of who Jesse Contour and Paula Rogers are. Jesse Contour is a creative technologist, designer, and animator. She has worked with AAA video game studios, museums, educational programs, and startups. Within these fields, her focus have been on creating interactive experiences for art, play, and education. She has built digital tools for news literacy and community engagement by also designing a permanent ex exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History to teach children about earthquakes. And, and she also launched video games as a part of a global team. So the amount of experience that Jesse Contour is immense. Same with Paula Rogers. Paula's work in print and radio has been featured by San Francisco's KQED Public Radio, also known as National Public Radio, and the Third Coast International Audio Festival and Salon. She worked as a writer and editor to create the book Show Me How, an infographic guide to life published by HarperCollins, and illustrated subsequent titles in the series. She's also been a, le a lead writer and story editor of the BAFTA-nominated game NeoCab, which was named one of the best titles of 2019 and awarded Best Narrative Design by Indiecade. So I'm extremely excited for these next two speakers because of the, the amount of experience that they have is grand. And so mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm willing to just stand my seat and look into these next two speakers. So without further ado, let's give it to Jesse Contour and Paula Rogers to take the floor. All right. I guess that means we should, we should take it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, we missed that cue. All um, right. Hello. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jessie and this is my co-presenter Paula, whichever way. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna start up my screen share so that we can get started. Here we go. So um, as you all hopefully know, our presentation is on uh, narrative mechanics, integrating uh, game mechanics and narrative. But before I let Paula take us off with an initial kind of definition, getting started, um, just to introduce us, we are both uh, assistant professors of practice at the University of Texas, Austin. We work in the arts and entertainment technologies department, and we're really excited to be uh, talking with you about our specialties, our specialties today. This talk is really a uh, merging of Paula and I's two specialties. She's, she's a master of storytelling, and I'm all about that interaction and game mechanic life. And um, so I think with that being said, I'll, we'll kick it off. Um, Paula, right. can you take it away? Thanks, Jesse. So yeah, this is a talk about narrative mechanics. Very simply, it's how to make your game help tell your story. Um, it's about thinking less about mechanics as a form of execution and thinking, it at, uh, thinking of it as an extension of expression. Um, so the main difference in interactive storytelling is that you're asking the audience to be active, not passive. That means you're asking them to do something while they're experiencing your story. And ideally what they're doing is in service of your story. That's what our whole talk is about. Um, now narrative doesn't change definition between formats, but it does change kind of application or have new needs. So but just for the sake of this talk, we put in a little bit of a definition of narrative very simply, it's plot plus protagonists, who they are, what they want, what's going to happen if they don't get it. That's like that idea of stakes or conflict. Um, and so mechanics or how the game works can help or hinder your storytelling based on how well the, it exists in service of those elements above. Um, at this point, we kind of all know to avoid ludonarrative dissonance, that idea that when the mechanics in the story are directly at odds, uh, but there's more nuance to it than that. Like they should also not just be opposed to each other, but working together. Um, they should not exi exist separate from each other. So they, it sh I like to think of it as like playing back and forth, like how a script uh, does the work, you know, with words and dialogue, but then in a film, there's also cinematography that says so much visually uh, and the two work back and forth and kind of trade that storytelling lift. Um, so we're gonna go through some examples of 
games that do that well, games that maybe could have done a different, gone a different path. And so I'm going to turn that over to Jesse to start talking about that. Okay. So, um, Standardized interfaces. Um, this is where we're going to start games that use these interfaces that are super accessible to all of us. So we can think about these as either the keyboard and mouse interface or kind of the standard game controller like PlayStation, Xbox, things like that. Um, so we have some, some pros and cons. So obviously these are the most common interfaces for designing game mechanics. Um, within these forms, we've grown into several standard designs for game control. So for example, everyone knows about WASD for character movement that can be enhanced with uh, using shift to run, space to jump, and you can build upon it further if you're doing a 3D game using the mouse for aiming um, or things like that. We all know that left, left mouse is probably triggering some kind of action or gun. Um, right mouse might be some kind of secondary interaction. And you can essentially plug and play the system into your game and 90% of your players will almost immediately know how to engage with the game. Like super easy, the joys of standard interfaces, right? Um, so the so that's the positives for that. But the negatives is it can be really easy to just rely on this common knowledge and create mechanics that don't necessarily actively support the narrative development. Um, at their best, the way that we use the keyboard and mouse can support the gameplay through how we actually play the game. Um, so like instead of using shift to run, could you make us rapidly press keys in some way to make us feel stress? Could you make us press and hold keys for tension? Um, can you make us kind of wait and then hit a key to test our reaction speed or maybe our fear response? So can you build upon this standard interface to make it better and support what your game is trying to do? Those are maybe some good some good examples. Um, some bad examples, I think we've are all played games that have like just totally unrelated mini games that have nothing to do with what the core story is doing. You know, it just, you're like, why? They just put a mini game in here for some reason. I have no idea why. Um, and it can really take you out. So really thinking about why and how you're using your interface can be super helpful. And I want to start off with a game that um, a lot of people have been talking about, and I will just be one more. So um, give me a second. I'm going to just gush about how much I love Hades. This was game of the year for a good reason. Uh, really incredible narrative development. Um, it's one of one of the really good examples that have come up that make losing feel like a win. Um, and they do a great job of um, making the game that might otherwise feel repetitive, feel really exciting through the way that they slightly change the way the character reacts with the game by choosing different weapons. So um, if you haven't played Hades, it's a roguelike dungeon crawler. You um, start in the house of Hades and you try to escape every round. Um, and depending on how far you get, you you know gain different sort of treasures and things like that um, and unlock things. And um, the bonus part is every time you die, you get taken back to the house and um, you get fed a little bit of narrative and it feels really good. And you might think that, oh, hey, trying to do the same exact thing every time, trying to escape this house, you're going through the same environments, that feels repetitive and boring. But it's not because of how they design the weapons and the upgrades every round. Now, um, I have a slide kind of talking about some of the different weapons. So, you know, you have your typical sword, your, your spears, your shields, your know, bows, things like that. Um, two of the ones that I really want to talk about in this game are the, the fists, the, the sort of melee weapon versus the bow. Now, um, like I mentioned before, Hades uses WASD um, as well as a few other keys. Um, and every weapon uses the same three, three buttons. Um, you have your main attack, secondary attack, and then you have your, your cast, which is not directly related to the weapon. But um, the twin fists are a melee-based weapon and they're heavily based. Lots and lots of clicking. When I play this game, I, when I play with the fist, my hands are tired by the end because I'm like punch, 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 punch. And it's this like really intense, awesome, heavily movement-based uh, weapon. And um, so you're rapidly kind of dashing around the screen and you're striking, striking. It's really exciting to use these. Now, if I'm um, prompted to use the bow, then it's the same button. So I already know how to use it, but it, it 
totally changes the gameplay experience. It requires patience. You're sort of staying more ranged combat. You're clicking and aiming. You're trying to really work on your timing. So you get the power shots that they build in. And it's really, really effective to just force me as a player to mix up my combat styles to make each round of the game more exciting. So they did such an incredible job just building off of the standard interface to make every round of this game exciting and different. Um, our next example is something totally different and I'm gonna <laughs> let Paula talk about this one. Yeah, so one of my favorite stories and pieces of media in the world is What Remains of Edith Finch. I played this game on PlayStation um, and I think I wanted to talk about it because for one, I think it's it's right on that line of what some people might be like, but is it a game? Um, but it's very interactive, it's very story driven. And I think it integrates mechanics into a pretty challenging story very beautifully so that you're able to inhabit characters literally in, your, in their shoes, but also figuratively and what you're feeling. Um, and you're even forcing the player to kind of take harmful actions through the mechanics, which I think is, is a, it's a huge ask and it's brilliantly done and pulled off in a really lovely experience. So the first example I wanna talk about is, um, the game is a series of vignettes. Uh, you're moving through a family tree of the Finch family who have this kind of like curse where they all meet an early end. You know that the story is gonna end in death each time. Um, so it's kind of like, well, how is this going to happen? Uh, the one that I wanna talk about is the baby Gregory. Um, who you, you start playing as Gregory and um, you're in this bathtub and there's this beautiful like kind of playful moment where you're playing with your bath toys. You have this magical frog, you can like move them around. It's very whimsical. The narration from your, your father at that point is about how this baby has this like magical, playful inner world and imagination. And while you're moving this frog, I mean, it's a very, very lovely experience. It's really fun. Um, but we all know what's gonna happen in the story. We all know how this vignette is going to end. Um, and at some point you have to use the frog to turn on the tap in the bath. The bath fills with water and that's how poor Gregory is killed, he drowns. Um, and what I think was so beautifully done about this is that it, it's not only is it like forcing you to do this action that you you really don't want to do and so with that I think a classic example of this idea of how interactive fiction can make you inhabit an experience and show you what an experience feels like by making you a participant in that in that narrative element in this death as opposed to like reading it on a page or seeing it on a screen you caused it even though you don't want it to happen um, and you are an adult not a baby and you can see what's going to happen but you have to do it anyway um, and that's just it's very impactful and I love how like the mechanic shifts in this vignette. Like it starts as just this playful moment with this frog, but then it takes a sinister turn. And using that same mechanic to shift the tone in the story, I think really helps mitigate the darkness that we know is coming and any resistance to the theme we might be feeling. Um, as you know, once the bathtub fills with water, it transitions into this more whimsical kind of moment where you're swimming when you know in real life or in the game, the, the baby is actually drowning. And here the dissonance of that, I feel like is really beautiful and haunting. Um, so it's really like simple mechanics, you're moving a frog, you're swimming, um, but when it's aligned with the narrative and used to kind of lift some of the things that would be uncomfortable for the narrative, um, it's just so beautifully done and it, the nuance is so lovely. Um, and it enhances uh, the emotionality of the experience. Another example I want to talk about uh, is Night in the Woods, uh, which is another narrative game. And I don't, I will end with a good example from Night in the Woods, <laughs> but there are two places where I felt there was a disconnect between gameplay and narrative consequences that left me feeling, as a player, left the story feeling flat. Um, so one of those is like a pretty simple, like standard button pushing game. You're, you're in a band, you're playing, you're practicing with your friends. Um, but there's really no real reason to try and be good at this. Like if you enjoy these types of games, here you go. I personally don't. 
Um, you can get different reactions, you can enjoy the songs, but the band is not much of a consequence in the story. And so practicing, it just feels, why am I doing this? It feels a little tedious. There's no like sense of reward. And so this is just to say that like the button pushing in and of itself is not inherently valuable enough to me as a player, especially in a story driven game. Another example um, from the same game, it's kind of what Jesse was alluding to earlier with this idea where you're like, oh yeah, my story is interactive. I've got many games, you can push some buttons, but does it affect the narrative? And this is happens in Night in the Woods with like moments where you're hanging out with your friends and you're eating. So you're at like a pizza place and you, you grab the slices of pizza to advance the conversation, but it just feels like a fancy way of turning a page, you know, like it doesn't feel that well integrated. Um, and these menial little actions can feel mundane or slow the pace of the story. That, the next one example of this is similar eating kind of dynamic around donuts. And now I can make a pun <laughs> that you won't hopefully hate me for, which is that the, I think the appeal of moments like this is that it can have a slice of life type feeling where you're like, oh yeah, this is just what it's like to have a body and eat food. But I think that the downside of that is that it, it, it's a big gamble, right? Because it can feel realistic or boring if there's not an inherent value to that interaction um, with stakes, like we talked about in that opening slide that progress the character's goals. But I would be remiss if I did not point out one final example from Night in the Woods, which is one of the most beautiful moments in games for me. Um, the slide is very dark, but briefly you are um, you're with a friend and you're looking at stars, making constellations at night in the woods. And your friend is telling you this like very dark emotional story of this traumatic thing that happened to him. And to advance the story, you have to connect the stars and make constellations. And to me, this worked really well because similar to the Edith Finch example, it's balancing extremely intense and emotional storytelling with like a kind of mundane movement to kind of let you rest, kind of let you enjoy like whimsy and delight. And I really felt that it it mimicked the physicality of being in a place with your friend where they're telling you something dark or painful. You can't look at them directly, you know, it just feels very, it feels very heavy. And so you kind of look at the stars or you look, you know, at the flowers around you or something. And I felt like it it made you inhabit that moment in a beautiful way. So here's like where these like mundane interactions can work, but you're seeing like in the cinematography example I mentioned, like there, there's two lifts going on. It's not just like narrative is doing everything and then we have mechanics, like they're both working together in this beautiful way. Um, which kind of brings us to our next section on tonal variety with Jesse. Yeah, so um, we want to talk a little bit about how you can build in different interactions to provide um, just variety of tone. We all know stories kind of change from being action packed to a little bit more chill. And how do you um, how do you emphasize that variety with the mechanics that you're bringing into your game? So um, our first example is Overcook 2. And um, I don't know if everyone has played this, but um, Paula and I played it to sort of refresh ourselves and get ready for this talk. And I am consistently blown away how a game that just like looks so cute is so stressful. <laughs> it's so <laughs> frantic. It's like you have to balance so many different things. Um, you're like collaborating with someone. You're trying to achieve these goals in the kitchen. You, um, if you even just look at the gameplay screen, you know, it's like you have all of the orders coming up. You have various things with timers that you're paying attention to. And if you like forget one, you will let your kitchen on fire. Believe me, that was my fault <laughs> several times while we were playing. And it's like this, and it's not only just the things that you're doing, but also your kitchen is sometimes like falling to pieces around you or moving and so there's like so many things to keep track of and then on top of that they have all these really juicy elements that you know the timer starts beeping the music speeds up and you're just like ah like in this kitchen the whole time you're playing and then you finish a level and you're like oh my god right you're you're exhausted by the end of this level and they give you the gift of this calming cute little bus that you get to drive around in between levels to give you a break, you know, to let you recover 
to let you um, have a little moment of exploration. You, when you drive this bus, it's controlled in the exact same way that you control the character. So there's no learning curve. You immediately know how to control it. Um, there's little unexpected moments where you have to like click little switches and unlock areas and your bus interacts with the environment in a really cute way. Like when it goes over water, it turns into a little boat. And it's all of these things that are like ultimately super low stakes, don't really affect the gameplay. All you're doing is moving between one level and another. But you can think about how they didn't have to do this for us, right? They didn't have to give us a little break. They could have just let us hit the next arrow and go to the next one. But instead, they decided to give us this like rest in between so that we can recharge and get ready for um, the next sort of intense level. And so this was something that was done really, really well. Um, it's like it's a really fun game if you haven't played it. Really recommend it. And um, Paul has a similar example for another game. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Yakuza Zero. Um, this is, I love this game because it's an example of how allowing a story to breathe with seemingly like off narrative gameplay, as Jesse was talking about, can also enhance the experience. So um, the basic plot. Uh, we can go to the next one. Um, Yakuza Zero is an action adventure game. You're in, it's an open world. Um, you're, it's dual protagonist. I'm going to talk about Kiryu, the protagonist we see here. Um, you're in these districts in Tokyo, but it's it's a prequel. Like I, I think it's the sixth in the series, the Yakuza series. So you know these characters already, and it's kind of like how they became who they are. So a lot of the game is like fighting. Um, it's unraveling this kind of Chinatown-esque plot. And the fighting mechanic is really good um, and character specific, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Uh, one of the charms of Yakuza 0 is that it has so many side quests and the tonal variety just narratively of the side quests are if the breadth is too much to mention. They all bring the setting to life in a way that really enhances the world building. But what I want to talk about is the bowling um, interaction that you can do in the middle of this kind of intense story. And uh, like Jesse was saying, it's, you know, you're using the same controller, obviously, on the PlayStation, but you're, now you're using it in a totally different way. And that relief uh, from that it gives the player that break of just like whimsy and fun is really effective. And narratively, I think it really supports the idea of the game where it's about someone who's forming an identity, still exploring who they are. Um, and so they have, there's this ability to like, yeah, what is it like if I go bowling for a little bit? I'm not totally on my path yet. I'm still kind of figuring out myself and experimenting. And I think that that's lovely when you can break that up with actual gameplay and mechanics too. Um, now I'm gonna, it's gonna take a turn <laughs> to Jesse. Okay, so um, it's time for my favorite thing, which is um, ranting about how much I do not like <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2. And I will caveat this with, I think that this game is really incredible in some ways. So the um, storytelling in this game, if this is a genre that you like, it's really compelling. Um, if it's not a genre you're attracted to, it's a little boring, you know, but that's the, that's the, I think the way that this genre goes. Um, also the environment is really beautiful. You know, as you're riding around on your horse, it's really like a very compelling place. You a lot of time, just, if I could just kind of ride my horse around in this game, I'd be really happy. Um, but this is a really excellent example of um, a game that is just trying to do too much. So um, there is, you know, we speak of side quests. I think this game is all side quests, right? Um, and the issue that this game comes into is in its attempt to provide variety in its gameplay, it has done too much. Um, one of the biggest complaints that you see about this game online is that, oh, I punched my horse um, or oops, I accidentally shot an NPC that I was intending to say hello to. And you know that when the issue, like people are interacting with the game in a way that they don't intend, that's not their fault. That's the fault of the control design, right? So instead of providing a shot of what the game looks like, I'm going to provide a shot of what the buttons do in this game. And if you just take a look at this, 
they're really atypical. They break from the muscle memory that other third person games provide. They, um, they have all of these things. They're like, oh, you can interact with the world in every way that you can imagine. But they have all of these interactions mapped in really confusing ways to the controller. So if I want to do any of these things that are exciting, I'm completely removed from the game because I find myself looking at my controller being like, wait, how do I hold this button and press that button and like move it this way? Like if I turn the controller upside down, then maybe I can like talk to this guy without punching him. Um, so it's, it's really confusing to actually play the game. Um, and these issues are kind of compounded by the strange way that the game takes control away from you at random moments. It will transition in and out of cinematic mode in a way that like doesn't make sense and that it'll just like kind of drop you back in in the middle of a fight and you're like whoa hang on I thought I was watching a movie um but no you have to um enter into a three page long radial menu to find the one item that you need to like strike camp for the night um and you have to be very dexterous you have to be able to press and hold move move the move the lever here press the trigger here you know it's like it's just really hard to play this game um some i've heard that if uh you have played other rockstar games there's like remnants of control schemes from other games but if you haven't played those games you don't know what those are so this game is it's just made clunky it's hard to play it's unpredictable what will actually happen if you like accidentally hit one button you could end up killing somebody that you really didn't want to and it's almost impossible to just get into that flow state that we're all looking for when we play because we're just distracted by these things that we don't intend to, to do. Um, so that's one example of just trying to do too much with atypical controls. Um, and so we've got another example from Paula. Yes, and speaking of unpredictable, there are very loud leaf blowers on outside my house right now. I really apologize if that noise is too much. I'll try to make this section brief. Um, so I'm gonna talk about just a really simple element or seemingly simple element of Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII, uh, which is around like too much gamification interrupting the experience. So here we see a GIF of fighting in the game and they had this element that was just like a roulette wheel and you can see in the upper left corner that's kind of always spinning um, randomizing if you're going to get these like big power ups and it's just too much like it doesn't really add to your gameplay and in fact when you do win it interrupts your combat and gives you a power up but it's it's like the worst possible moment even when you're getting a good thing uh it feels interrupted so this is an example of just like too much. Um, and when something, even though it, it looks really cool or seems really interesting, again, like doesn't have that like narrative kind of anchor. Um, it can, even if it's designed to help enhance the gameplay, uh, can feel disruptive. All right, so um, I'm going to move us into our final section, which is talking about alternative interfaces. So um, this is a really fun thing, the joys of designing your own controller. So we're moving away from standard interfa interfaces into alternative interfaces. Um, so when you are making your own controllers, that means that you can make exactly what your game needs to support its experience. And this means specificity, specificity, specificity. So like how close can we get to the feel that we want to build into our game? And I wanna start off with a little bit of an exercise which is thinking about what does racing feel like? Now, I'm assuming that everyone watching this has played Mario Kart at some point, you know, the classic game. Um, this, this game is awesome. I'm not gonna complain about Mario Kart. But I wouldn't, I would argue that it doesn't necessarily feel like racing when you are playing it. There's a lot of hold A to accelerate. You know, there's some skill involved when you're navigating the course and trying to get the pickups. And, you know, there's that competitive feel because you're typically playing with friends, but it doesn't necessarily get your heart pumping in the way that a, like a race might actually. So I want to talk about two other examples, which are um, arcade games that are both really incredible. Now, um, Black Emperor, which you can see on the right side of the screen, is a motorcycle racing game. And to just briefly describe how it works, you're on a motorcycle, you're following a road that is kind of scrolling past. 
and um, you have the ability to either accelerate or kind of not. Um, if you are accelerating, you're moving forwards across the screen. If you're not accelerating, you're not pressing the button, you kind of move backwards and will eventually fall off the screen. You also have the ability to roll this roller to move yourself up and down the Y axis. And you're trying to stay on the road um, so that you can move quickly. You're also trying to avoid sand traps and things like that. Now, this game is so incredible because you're really kind of balancing this act of rolling the roller feels like steering you have to kind of react very quickly it's really exciting that kind of precision steering is what you're really getting out of this game and you're balancing your position on the screens so you're sort of moving up and back and up you know forwards and backwards up and down and it's a really exciting kind of precise gameplay moment um, another example something totally different is um, this game called powerboat italia so the way that you um, play this game is it's a multiplayer arcade game. You um, are racing as a, a power boat up a river and you are essentially just trying to go as fast as you can while hitting a jump button to go over obstacles that are in your way or um, to hit uh, little speed boosts. And um, the way that you go faster is by hitting, alternating hitting of two buttons as quickly as you can. So you have these two arcade buttons and you are you're like trying to mash, alternating mash them as fast as you can. And you have to do it with one hand because you're using your other hand to jump. So you have one hand while you're playing this game that is as working as hard as it can to play this game. And I will tell you that if your whole arm isn't cramped up by the end of a round, you're not racing hard enough in this game. Like I, my arm was sore for like three days the first time I played this game because I got so into it. And it's like my, again, my heart is pumping. My arm is hurting, but I like can't stop because the round's not over. And it's just the intensity rises and rises and rises. And it's such an amazing example of how you really make racing feel like racing through the interaction with the game. It's like so intense. It's done really, really well. And um, so this, game feel in both of these arcade games doesn't necessarily tie to a narrative, but we can use them as an example of how you can make play more immersive through how you interact with the game. Like I have never been so into racing games as I have been these two arcade games are so fun. Um, uh, another example I have is this game called Hell Couch, which is much more narrative. And I'm gonna just start playing this video as I describe it, but it's essentially a cooperative game where the couch is the controller. Your couch is possessed by a demon and you have to exercise this demon by jumping on the couch. And um, it's really fun, so immersive, and it feels really good to play. So it evokes this very childlike experience of jumping on the bed. Um, this act of physically tackling the demon with your body like is so fun. And it really feels competitive and you have to pay attention. It's also collaborative. So you're potentially like banging into the other person. Um, and also um, something that's a little different than a lot of games is that the scale of the controller is so large that it's such an immersive experience. You're really like in this couch while you're playing. Um, and this is a really, really well done um, gamified experience that's heavily tied to this narrative, right? Of like your couch is haunted. Um, Another example, um, so let me go to the next slide. Um, so you might think that games like this are not like mainstream, like, oh, these are just, you know, arcade games that are sort of one-offs or hell you know, but GDC has an entire section of their conference that is dedicated to alt control games. So this, this area of game design, it's really blowing up right now. If you're able to design and build an entire game experience around a custom interaction, um, I have some images like one of my favorites is the plunger game you can see in the top left you're actually like using a plunger to play games that are like based around plunging mechanics it's really fun also super funny right like it really brings that fun element into gaming. Um, there's also really innovative innovative controllers like people are making laser harps to play games, um, you know if you. I'll hark back to Hades for a moment that that game in the lower left is, is um, based on um, Orpheus. So if you've played Hades, you know, that'll get you excited. But, um, you know, there's games you can play as a unicorn. You can play collaborative, collaboratively with your body, with other people. Um, and you can just design this really like intense, custom, specific, 
super fun controllers that'll enhance your gameplay through just very specific interactions. And it's a really wide open field with lots of room for creativity and innovation. Um, and so I think that with that said, we're going to wrap up our talk, uh, Paula. Yeah. yeah, so um, final thoughts on all of this. You know, throughout we've been talking and giving examples that I think really embody that classic writing maxim, show, don't tell, right? <laughs> and something that I say a lot and I think maybe isn't talked about enough is that when you are doing an interactive story, when you're asking players to embody your narrative, it's a much bigger ask than if you're asking them to watch your movie or watch your episodes of your show or whatever. It's that active experience kind of is, is an emotional load that you're asking um, of your player. And so thinking about, well, how can we tell stories more like mindfully or use that physicality, that like intensity of that interaction to our advantage. Um, and so like the examples that we saw really, the ones that we talked about that do that really well, um, like Edith Finch, like Hades, like advancing the story in a way that's emotional and consequential. Again, going from just like execution to another form of expression um, in your story and where mechanics kind of, there's opportunities left on the table with them as if they fall flat, if they're not connected to the narrative, if they're inelegant, overly complicated, or like in the sense of the Final Fantasy example, like you couldn't control that. So it did feel tangential because there was no like way to know when the roulette wheel was gonna stop. Um, and so these kinds of, this thoughtful, this intentionality can go back to that idea of that, you know, interactive stories ask a lot of the player, but I think looking at like Night in the Woods, looking at Edith Finch as perfect examples of this, which have like darker moments, what the mechanics of those moments did is that they let the, let the player set the pace. You know, I know this baby is going to die. I'm going to do it when I'm ready. Or I know my friend is going to tell me this like horrible emotional story. I'm figuring out, I'm setting the pace, I'm controlling when I'm getting this information. And I think that's a, just a really sensitive way of thinking about how mechanics can also let us tell deeper stories and bigger stories and more emotional stories and do some of that emotional lifting for us. As a writer, you know, I'm not going to say like, it's not about dialogue and prose because it is, but this is part of your toolkit as well. And sometimes those mechanics can have those, carry those moments better than crafted words. There, I said it. Um, so that's the idea of the talk, just using your mechanics to draw your players in deeper into your story. I think we have some time for questions. Yeah. Uh, but we also wanna say thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, and this is how to contact us. Yeah. I tweet like twice, it's mostly about my cat. Uh, but you can, you know, find me there. Or here's my email address as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions. The first one comes from Clay. What kind of stories would you like to tell next? Ooh, I'll let Paula take this one. <laughs> well, um, this has been announced. So I am a lead writer on a story called uh, Goodbye Volcano High. And that is about teenage dinosaurs who are facing the end of the world. You can look that up. It's um, beautiful art um, in that game. Um, but that's kind of like, I guess what I was talking about where it's like, wow, that's a dark story, but like, how can we like mitigate that or like make it a more emotional experience through like making it interactive? Um, how is that? How is that a different format? And I also like, I just have a personal life goal to tell a ghost story and a time travel story, and I will do it at some point. <laughs> How about you, Jesse? Ooh, I think one of the, I really like tying stories. I think Hades really spoke to me as a game because I like tying back into those kind of historical narratives. So I think if I were to design, to design a game, I might go for something like that. Um, I'm not as much into writing my own personal narratives, but um, I think if I were to do my own, um, it would be some, some sort of historical fiction take. 
it's always fun to play with kind of the tropes of how things have been represented in the past and how you can kind of change them for a modern audience. Absolutely. All right. I know your talk kind of talked about this throughout, but uh, we get a lot of students who ask, you know, what is the best balance between narrative and gameplay? And if you had to sum it up in one answer, how would how would you respond? That's a great question. I think the balance is different depending on the type of story. You know, um, if you if you think about I mean, if we, we can go back to our first couple examples of Hades versus Edith Finch, two games that were both in really incredibly done. Edith Finch is much more narratively driven, right? I mean, it's pretty much it's pretty much an interactive narrative, um, whereas Hades, you're fed bits of the narrative, but it's there's a lot more focus on sort of learning the combat nature of the game and really gaining your skills in in playing it. So. I, I don't know if there's like an ideal balance and it really just kind of depends on the experience that you're trying to tell um, or the experience that you're trying to build for your players. Um, that's, so that's what I would say, Paula. Absolutely. I think that's kind of like what we were hopefully trying to get across to you is that it, it should be bespoke to whatever story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And our last question here is on the custom interactions. Do you see this becoming more popular? And what custom interactions would you like to see be prevalent? Yeah. Um, so with custom interactions, I definitely think these kind of custom interfaces are becoming more popular with the growth of um, the Ar Arduino and microcontrollers and this, this aspect of physical computing kind of being tied into um, gameplay. It's like easier and easier to, to build some sort of sensor driven control with an Arduino and then tie it into Unity. It's super easy. There's like plugins in the Unity store that you can connect to. Um, or, you know, even easier ways if you're using like a controller like the Teensy or something like that. You can literally just make like a keyboard emulator, but like as a physical controller, it just ties in and is really easy to get working. And so with that side of the development becoming uh, much more accessible, I definitely see this area, um, you know, entering the main, the mainstream more and more. Um, and you can even see that with how GDC's alt control showcase, right? There's an entire section of the game developers conference that is about work like this. And um, I think what I would like to see is just letting people, um, don't be afraid to make a single mechanic game, right? It's a great entry point into designing systems and progression in your game. You know, it you can easily tie a single mechanic to story if that's what you like to do, um, or you can tie it to a more arcadey type game, um, which is you know that competitive element. Um, but you know, some of the most delightful games I've played are single mechanic games. Um, there's a student I know um, who developed a game about uh, d driving a train. You know, and it, they built this controller where you get to like raise and lower this this lever and it, they're sort of making it's a little bit of a train simulator system and it was really fun because there's this gamification about your timing and it feels really good to play because they built it into a really large controller um and it was just really fun it was a way to explore this area of um of game making uh yeah paula do you have any interactions you would like to see <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think it'll probably become more mainstream as we're all becoming more, like games are becoming more mainstream. So it makes sense that experimentation would as well. Yeah, I totally agree. All right, thank you again for being a part of CSGC 2021. Uh, we really enjoyed your talk and uh, thanks for, for being on here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.